Uh, hello, good evening everyone and thank you for coming along to our CPD seminar and welcome everyone uh, who's online as well. We've got people uh, uh, live with us here in Chambers and we've got people signing in uh, online. Um, tonight's topic is um, about effective drafting of affidavits and it's one of our CPD seminars on litigation essentials. Uh, my name is Derek Hand and with me is Julie Wright. We're both barristers here at uh, Greenway Chambers, both practicing predominantly in construction law and like all members of Greenway Chambers dealing on a daily basis with uh, the drafting of um, affidavits. Um, what we hope to offer is some practical tips, some practical guidance on the drafting of um, affidavits. If you've got questions, please feel free to ask them for those online. Please free, feel free to send them through. We'll see them here uh, uh, at the desk. Um, the, the, the key message I think that both Julie and I would like to convey is, is uh, to have an appreciation and an understanding for the fact that affidavits are really instruments of persuasion. They're a very, very important tool uh, in seeking to persuade a tribunal uh, uh, or a court and indeed uh, your opponent. I'll come to that uh, in due course. We have structured our talk around five questions. The why, who, when, what, and how. And we'll run uh, through those uh, five questions in the course of the next half hour, 40 minutes or so. Um, before we start into it, um, the, in, into our discussion, a document we came across and aware of is the Sedley's Law of Documents. Now, I don't know, is anybody in the room aware of Sedley's Law of Documents? You, you may not. Just briefly, by, by, by background, so Stephen Sedley was a judge of the Court of Appeal in the uh, UK, Court of Appeal of England and Wales, and he devised Sedley's Law of Documents, which applies as much to affidavits as it does to any other documentary evidence. There are 12 laws. I'll only deal with the first uh, five. Julie will deal with the rest. Uh, um, first law, documents may be assembled in any order, provided it's not chronological, it's not numerical, and it's not alphabetical. Documents shall in no circumstances be paginated continuously. No two copies of any bundle shall have the same pagination. Uh, we're all getting the drift that obviously this is very much tongue-in-cheek, but this is the... This is the uh, 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 really a complaint from the bench about the quality of the documents that come before it. Uh, any important documents shall be omitted, and on it goes. These, of course, are precisely how not to prepare um, uh, affidavits. Um, let's talk about the why. Um, why prepare an affidavit? Well, uh, in modern litigation, the affidavit is now the most common means of giving evidence in courts and in tribunals. Um, the reason for the prevalence of affidavits, of course, over oral testimony, uh, is that uh, there's a requirement now for justice to be uh, quick, cheap, and just. Uh, you'll notice the comma between quick and cheap. Uh, qu uh, quick, cheap, and just uh, means that the preparation of affidavits will hopefully uh, save the hearing time involved in the adducing of evidence. Um, it also reduces uh, surprise, the element of surprise, by allowing parties to know in advance what is the nature of the evidence to be given. There are, of course, exceptions to that. In the federal court, for example, uh, uh, evidence of contentious conversations is often required to be given orally. And in New South Wales, in the Supreme Court, judges, and indeed in the district court, judges have expressed uh, preferences from time to time for evidence to be given orally rather than by way of affidavit and that might particularly be in um, in circumstances of for example allegations of fraud um, and I'll, we'll, I'll address that briefly uh, in terms of how you go about preparing that evidence shortly um, I mentioned that uh, sorry yes to the why I mentioned that um, uh, uh, an affidavit uh, is an instrument of persuasion, and that is that it tells your client's story to an audience. And on screen we've put uh, the essentials. Uh, why? Well, it's to persuade. It's all about persuasion. 
and uh, it is also about telling your client's version of uh, events, your client's story. Let us go to the second, the next question, which is who? Who is, uh, who's the audience? And who also should be the witnesses? Well, dealing first of all with the audience, the primary audience is, of course, in the work we do, the primary audience is uh, a judge or a, uh, a tribunal member, a decision maker, and of course, any appellate uh, a tribunal. But it's not just uh, a court. Uh, um, an audience would also be your opponent and indeed your opponent's client. Uh, just think about the uh, number of times when you've encountered really well-prepared affidavits and you think, well, we, we've, got, we've, we've, we, we've got some fight on our hands here. Think also about the times when you've encountered really badly prepared affidavits and you think, well, we have to sort through this now to figure out what's, what, what's really important and what's not so important. And you immediately form an impression about uh, the other side's case. So it is uh, um, with courts and tribunals. Um, the who is uh, an important question also. I'm going to say who, for whom uh, is the audience uh, in the preparation of an affidavit. It's also an important question to ask in yourself when you're drafting an affidavit. Um, stand in the shoes of a reader. Is the drafting assist, going to assist or hinder a reader? And a topic that Julie's going to address further later on, um, and one that I'll touch upon now, is the, the use of, for example, defined terms. The purpose of defined terms in a document is to assist the reader. It's not to assist you to mean that you don't have to type out more words. It, of course, it can, can achieve that objective provided it's used properly. But the, the purpose of defined terms is to assist uh, the reader. When you get to a stage where there are so many defined terms that you effectively need a glossary uh, to find your way through it, um, the, the power or the utility of a, the use of, of defined terms loses its impact, to my observation. There's also a, a temptation to overuse the defined terms, you know, like the, you know, uh, capital Y, your capital L letter. Well, we all know what letter we're talking about, you know, or, or the letter or my first affidavit, for example. But I would just encourage you to be mindful of how you use defined terms why defined terms are, may, may be applicable or may be useful in, um, in drafting an affidavit. Um, but crucially, stand in the shoes of a reader. Is it really assisting the reader uh, in uh, finding uh, her or his way through an affidavit? The second component of the question of who is, well, who are the witnesses? And in accordance with, if you like, the best evidence rule, the best witness is an eyewitness who can describe what she or he heard or said or felt or otherwise perceived. Um, depending upon the context, there are other factors that need to be considered in deciding on who uh, will be a witness and, who's, and who should uh, uh, be the, the, the opponent of an affidavit. Obviously, are they willing to give evidence? Uh, how are, are they willing to be cross-examined? What is their personality and experience? These are all factors that are relevant in a decision about uh, who will be the witness. You also need to think about the effect of not calling a particular witness. Will it give rise to a Jones and Dunkel inference, for example? Uh, um, 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 can, can the failure to call a witness be explained? If so, how? So that deals with the why and the who. Let us move to the next question, which is when. Um, and in respect of when, two questions arise. When, when is an affidavit appropriate? And then when, when do I prepare the affidavit? Um, when is it appropriate? Well, there may be circumstances where it is better to have the evidence of disputed conversations adduced orally. And as I mentioned earlier, that's typically in a case of uh, where there are, there are allegations of fraud or misrepresentation. And there is some case law on this, I won't take it to the case law now, but um, the cases illustrate the 
utility in the probity in giving in that in evidence of disputed conversations being given orally rather than with the assistance of a solicitor or with uh, the involvement of a, a, a counsel. That's not to say that even in those cases that there's not a role for an affidavit. An affidavit may address all other matters, for example, um, um, leaving the uh, disputed account of conversations, for example, to be given orally. The question of when do I prepare the affidavit? Well, as, as early as possible. Um, we all know that the practical realities are that pressures of practice mean that it's not always possible to uh, start the affidavit, start the preparation of an affidavit earlier than what might be ideal, but really as early as possible. Um, crucially, please appreciate that the story comes out of the chronology, and that really is important. The chronology is crucial in terms of uh, constructing the narrative, but also drawing out what are the essential facts and a sense of what's really gone on in a case. So I would, I would encourage you, and I think Julie would join me in this, to say always, always prepare a chronology and have that chronology to assist you in the preparation of the evidence. Um, I know that um, a practice that's certainly been drilled into me in my time at the bar, and I do it consistently, is that if there is an event on a date, start with the date, on 29 April 2022, comma, rather than uh, we went to the shops on the 22nd of April, whatever it might be, so that you've got a marker, you've got a chronological marker uh, going through the document. Um, best practice, and I realise that this is in a really ideal world, uh, the best practice is to have your uh, evidence, your affidavits prepared in a very advanced draft before doing your pleading because then your pleading is less likely to require some form of amendment later on to bring it into conformity with the state of the evidence. Now, I appreciate that um, uh, uh, you're all under enormous pressure in your practices and you've got lots of uh, work on. Um, and I don't, we're not lecturing from here saying that, you know, prepare, prepare your affidavit before your pleading, but in an ideal world, think about how that would play itself out. It really is a great assistance to have an advanced uh, draft uh, of an affidavit before a, ple a pleading is prepared. If you've got time, of course, it is great to be able to serve the evidence in conjunction with uh, 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 or shortly after the service of the pleading, so that it all happens uh, quite quickly, particularly if once the defence goes on, if you can get your evidence uh, served. That alone has some persuasive effect. Um, the next question is then what? What's the subject matter of the affidavit and what do I need to address? Well, obviously the context are going to be, is it in chief? Is it, is it responsive? Is it in reply? Is it an interlocutory matter where the rules of evidence um, uh, shift slightly? Um, in any event, whatever uh, uh, stage of evidence you're dealing with, the starting point has to be an identification of the issues. What are the issues? Um, for a plaintiff, it's usually prepared by reference to the pleading, of course, uh, um, and draft also with an eye to the remedies sought. Um, turning back to, like, for example, the position of the plaintiff, well, what are the elements I need to prove? And prepare your checklist. I, I know when I'm drafting affidavits, I will have my notes through a draft where I, I identify what are the elements I need to prove, what's this going to go to, and then I can strip out those subheadings later on, but at least I've got a checklist going through a draft that is my own um, formulation of what I consider is necessary by reference to the pleadings. Um, <clears throat> in oh, I, Another note, but if you are for the plaintiff, keep in mind that you will have the opportunity to reply to a defendant's evidence, so don't feel that you need to anticipate everything that a defendant may say in their evidence, that you often see that in affidavits as a tendency to anticipate well, what might come in. Well, you've got to, you, as a plaintiff, you've got an opportunity to reply, and as a cross claim, you've got an opportunity to reply. So um, um, keep that in mind. Um, with reply evidence, um, 
ask yourself, what, what is it that I need to reply to in the evidence of the defendant? And understand that reply is not an opportunity to bolster your evidence in chief. And, and you may anticipate that an objection will be taken to uh, evidence in chief coming in at the reply stage, or alternatively at least some adjustment to a timetable to allow the other side to deal with what is properly be characterized as evidence in chief. Um, again, if you're for the defendant, ask yourself, what do I need to address in respect of the issues that were pleaded? Uh, what's required to refute the uh, evidence from the moving party, from the plaintiff? Or what's required to establish positive defences? Now again, a practical step in that we said this was a, some practical tips, might be to put some headings into your draft affidavit to give you some structure to make sure that you've touched upon uh, 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 miraculously that your evidence addresses what is required to be addressed in, by reference to the pleadings and then remove those uh, subheadings later on. The how. Well, um, how deals with uh, several matters. What are the formal requirements? Um, in, in respect to the formal requirements, Understand that procedure, the rules of procedure, or the requirements of procedure are your friend. Think about the rules of procedure, the rules in the UCPR, the court rules in respect of the practice notes in respect to what's required. Don't think of those as being a, a, a difficult burden or an insurmountable um, um, objective. Treat them as your friend. They give you structure. Uh, and have them in mind. Have a copy with you of what's required under the rules. For example, um, the, the, the UCPR requires that um, if it's less than 50 pages, if, if the uh, documents that are going to be attached to an affidavit are less than 50 pages, well then there may be a lecture. If they're greater than uh, 50 pages, then use an exhibit. Very straightforward. Um, and the reason for that is obviously about the management of the amount of number of documents uh, uh, that will be adduced in, in, in conjunction with an affidavit. But that's a very straightforward rule. There's no real reason, there's no good reason for that rule to be offended, given how straightforward it is. Um, if one looks to the rules of court generally, for example, the, the, the simplicity of it, uh, each affidavit should uh, have a heading setting out the name of the deponent and the date of making of the affidavit. This is the, the, the affidavit of X sworn on uh, Y. Consecutively numbered paragraphs, that pretty obvious. Um, uh, one subject per paragraph uh, is required. I've mentioned about the inextras versus an exhibit and amendments uh, must be initialed or leave will be required to file the affidavit. Pay attention to the jurat. Is it sworn or is it affirmed? It's not sworn and affirmed or not sworn forward slash affirmed. Pay, yeah, be, careful, be careful about that. Objection is sometimes taken to improperly uh, uh, prepared affidavits on that basis. Um, particular judges and lists also have some particular requirements. Um, in the technology construction list, the use of chronological bundles, which Julie's going to address um, um, in a short while. Um, some customary requirements. By customary, I mean accepted uh, practice. Um, some cardinal rules, again, I mentioned earlier, organize your material chronologically, uh, that alone is persuasive, and give evidence of conversations in uh, direct speech. Now, there are different views about this. I know um, I've had cases in, in Victoria where um, they think it's very odd, <laughs> at least <laughs> they've told me they think it's very odd, that we insist upon evidence in the way we do in New South Wales by, by way of direct speech. It seemed a bit more uh, relaxed about that um, in the few moments I've been in Victoria. Um, but here in New South Wales, certainly, um, the use of direct speech enables the presentation of evidence in a more admissible and less objectionable form, and it's likely to carry more weight. And in that respect, when you are preparing um, uh, affidavits, give the witness uh, her or his voice in an affidavit. Um, use the actual words if the witness can recall them, um, rather than 
a form of words that, that might use language, for example, that the witness might not even understand, or it would not be a word that that witness would ever use. And you will see that in cross-examination from time to time, that a witness is asked to explain, well, what, you know, um, when you use the word concurrently, what did you mean? Well, um, I mean, it, it, in, in, on one view, that might be a bit uh, of a cheap shot, perhaps, but if the witness has said, this is absolutely my evidence, and I prepared, and I didn't have any input from anybody else, and there, there are words in there, I've used the word concurrently as a, an example, but I've seen it in one case, but um, be careful about that. Be careful not to impose upon a witness your legal training and uh, your qualifications as a, a solicitor uh, to, to use language that is not the language of, a, um, of the uh, witness. We drafted an example of what not to do, and you don't see this very often, but we do. We at the bar certainly see it, and I doubt the, the courts see it more frequently. Um, but let me give you an example of how not to do it, and then an example of direct speech of how it might work. Right? Um, this is evidence about uh, an email that's uh, uh, provided between or sent between two two people uh, in respect of a um, uh, a sale of a business. Um, Quote, by that electronic email message, I confirmed that the defendant and I had entered into an enforceable contract for valuable consideration on the 21st day of March in the year of our Lord, 2018. <laughs> Alex understood, and so did I, that we'd reached an enforceable legal contract. On the aforementioned day, namely the 21st day of March in the year of our Lord, 2018, the defendant and I conferred at the coffee house called Silk's Coffee Lounge, located in the property known as 170 Phillips Street, Sydney, in the state of New South Wales. We agreed that I would sell and he would purchase the 500 shares. Okay, okay. perhaps uh, a bit of an extreme example. Let's look at how you might otherwise do that. During our meeting, we had a conversation. That conversation included an exchange in words to the following effect. I said, I'll sell you my 500 shares in the company for $50 each. He said, you're dreaming, mate, Zero, $40 tops. I said, you're one tough bastard. Okay, done. Now, uh, the point of that uh, exercise is just to illustrate that allow your witness uh, uh, the space to give the evidence in the words of that witness and in the words that she or he may recall from uh, a conversation. Um, more often than not, the witness is not going to recall the precise words that were used. I mean, how many of us could recall with any certainty what we had for breakfast last Tuesday morning, for example, uh, a week ago. Um, um, the, I, the, 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 the idea that witnesses are going to recall precise com the precise words of precise conversations from three or four years ago is not entirely realistic. So there's some conversations that, that are going to be standout conversations that are going to call, recall precisely. And on that, a, a good technique that you can use is to say, well, I, you, you remember the words very clearly, but who else was in the room? What were they wearing? Was there anything that's a standout about what happened in that meeting that is in your mind? And that sort of material helps to uh, support that uh, witness's version of events if they have a very clear recollection of it. More commonly than not, however, um, they won't recall precisely what was said, which is why you use the device of words to the effect of. Um, as a matter of common sense, um, in respect of dates and amounts, uh, etc., use numbers, not words. Um, the, a convention is to, from numbers 1 to 9, spell them out, from number 10 onwards, use numbers. Try to get into that habit as well. Um, one of the other notes we have here is use appropriately sized staples. Just think of the volume of material that goes through the court um, every day. Um, there are then ethical parameters, and I'm going to hand over to Julie now to address uh, <clears throat> you on that. Thank you, Derek. Um, so, of course, we've all got ethical duties that we have to follow when um, preparing affidavit evidence. And obviously, some of these are matters of common sense, but it doesn't hurt to just remind ourselves that they are, in fact, rules of conduct that we are, of course, all obliged to follow. Um, we're not allowed to suggest evidence to a witness. You can't coach a witness and you can't tell them what it is that they'll need to put in their affidavit. And I know that sounds very obvious, but quite often I see people preparing draft affidavits for a witness without ever having even spoken to the witness. 
and you know maybe all you're doing is setting out a skeleton of the topics you want the witness to cover to remind yourself that that's what you're going to go through when you talk to them but sometimes I think the pre-existing affidavit can go a bit far and start to put words in the witness's mouth that that witness wouldn't otherwise say um, and you know what, what, one thing to love about witnesses is that they will throw you under a bus as soon as look at you so they will get in the witness box and tell the judge within two sentences that, oh no no the solicitor drafted that for me I just signed it really useful words to that effect so um, the um, more that it's their words, the less likely they are to get into the box and say, oh, no, no, that, that's not me, that's my affidavit. So uh, it's, a, it's a common sense, but also it pay, pays you back by uh, the witness sticking to their affidavit going forward. Um, it's, you're obliged to tell the witness that they have to tell the truth and to um, test the evidence that they give you. So if what you're told is inconsistent with... 10 pieces of paper and evidence that you know somebody else will give and we'll come back to what you can tell witnesses about other people's evidence in a minute uh, you're entitled to test them and say well you know I know you've told me that uh, you didn't attend this meeting on this day but here's three emails that you sent after the meeting that you didn't attend telling people about what happened at the meeting here's a set of minutes and so on and so on because um, you don't know if a witness is telling you the truth or not but you can certainly spot evidence that is inconsistent with other evidence and you know explain to them that uh, something doesn't seem to be quite right here. Um, the integrity of evidence, this um, legal profession uniform solicitor's conduct rules deals with all of this and at rule 25 they talk about the fact that if you've got more than one witness you can't see them together. Now we, we know those things of course you can give people general warnings together and general um, 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 preparation about what, what they might expect at trial, what the courtroom looks like, and so on and so forth. But you, of course you cannot discuss with, with two witnesses the content of their evidence at the same time. And that is something that witnesses themselves don't necessarily understand very well. So um, it's a good idea to warn them that they cannot discuss their evidence with somebody else. I usually try to put that in writing to witnesses. Very, very specifically, do not discuss your evidence with this witness over here or that one over there or anyone else. Um, it, it's something that unfortunately I think lay people don't necessarily think that they're doing the wrong thing in discussing the witness, in discussing their evidence with their mate or their colleague or, or so on and so forth. It's part of the ordinary course of events that they think they can discuss court proceedings. Um, don't disclose to your witness evidence that's going to be given by other people that you are also calling witnesses but you can show your witness evidence on the other side particularly obviously if what it is that they're doing is responding if you're putting on responsive evidence or evidence in reply they will need to look at what other people have said and deal with other people's evidence in response um, in terms of administering an oath to a witness you have to be absolutely sure that that witness understands the oath, understands that what they're swearing up to is truthful evidence, and you can't rely on someone else having asked them that. If you're taking somebody's oath, you need to be very sure yourself, satisfied that they know what they're doing. Now, um, you, you, know, you might tell from my accent, I'm originally from the UK. In the UK, we have a totally different procedure for swearing affidavits than you do here. And in the UK, if you are working at law firm A, Nobody in law firm A can swear your client's affidavit. You have to go to law firm B or C. Now, when you're a junior solicitor, this is a great gag because you get paid for swearing affidavits. So you phone up your mate who works for law firm B and they run over and take your client's affidavit. And it was used to be four English pounds for an affidavit and two pounds for each exhibit, which when you're a starving you know, training solicitor, this is great. Um, I did check today, it's still only five pounds. 23 years later, so it's not going up a lot. But um, the point of that practice is that it's somebody who has nothing to do with the preparation of the affidavit who comes in, looks at the affidavit, looks the witness in the eye and makes sure that they understand their obligations when they're swearing the affidavit. Now obviously we don't have that practice here in New South Wales but I think it might be good practice when you're getting a client in to swear an affidavit to get someone else outside your team even who's got nothing to do with it to come in and be the person who takes the oath rather than anyone who is actually involved in the drafting 
It just protects you a little bit from standing away from the affidavit and making sure that the uh, affidavit's been properly sworn. So, something to have a think about. Um, avoid asking leading questions of the witness when you're taking the affidavit. That was my point earlier about you know drafting a pre-existing affidavit and don't point about the witness speaking for themselves. It has to be in their voice, not in, in your voice. And um, as I said, a witness will um, get tripped up if they've got words in their affidavit that are not their own. They'll either be cross-examined about it um, or they'll uh, say something inconsistent with it and they will very quickly disavow that evidence. Um, now, evidentiary considerations. Obviously, the first and foremost question is, um, is it relevant? Right, Section 55 of the Evidence Act, that's the starting point for the admissibility of all evidence. Is it relevant to the issues in dispute? Um, there's quite a lot of interesting case law about this, and there was a decision of um, Justice Pembroke, um, Thomas and SMP, and I won't read you a big passage from it, but um, he rejected a whole stack of evidence on the basis it, that it just didn't even pass this very basic threshold of relevance and um, made some comments about um, the affidavit being inappropriate, confusing and unhelpful. Um, so prolix examination of minutiae carried out without any loyally discrimination. The majority of it is irrelevant to the resolution of the factual and legal issues that I must decide. Now, we've all got to control that. Clients sometimes get very excited about things that they want to say, and it's all very interesting, and they want to recite the whole history of you know, the five years that they've been in dispute with the horrible people on the other side or whatever it is. Um, you've got to wade through that and you've got to cut some of it out and you've got to direct it to the issues in dispute and go back to the pleadings. What is it that you've got to prove? That's what you need the evidence of. Is it in dispute? If something is admitted on the pleading, you don't need to go to chapter and verse on that either. Okay, it's really try to really focus um, what the affidavit covers. Um, as Derek said before when he read out the example of what not to do, avoid conclusions and submissions. So clients love to say, I agree this with that person over there because they think they did and they think that that is evidence that they can give, that they agreed something. That's not evidence that a witness can give. It's for the court to decide whether or not something was agreed. All the witness can say is the conversation I had was A, B, C, D and then the court can decide whether or not that, that's an agreement. Um, so that's a, a really obvious um, trap to fall in. People do that all the time. Um, imagine, if you will, when you're drafting an affidavit, that your witness is somebody who walks around, you know, in our case we do lots of construction disputes, the building site, or whether it's the cafe when you're having a conversation with a person, whatever it is, with a video camera on their head. Right? Imagine they're a GoPro. Whatever they record, seeing, doing, listening, whatever, that's what they can put in their affidavit. Right, that is their evidence. It is what they saw, what they heard, what they said, etc., etc. It is not anything else. Um, failure to adhere to some of these rules can lead to adverse costs um, orders, and of course, that's something we'd all like to avoid. Um, there was a, uh, um, a case in 2007 when um, um, a party was ordered that it wasn't a successful party didn't get its cost of proceedings because um, there's quite a lot of problems with um, admissibility of some of the affidavit evidence and this happens more than you know any of us would like to think I've got a recent matter where a judge made some similar comments now luckily it's not the case that every time a piece of evidence is inadmissible that there follows an adverse cost order but um, it's still something that we should all guard against um, Derek's point about letting the witness um, speak through the affidavit is um, similar to my point about it shouldn't be drafted in advance and we've got cases that say um, it's not possible to draft an affidavit without sitting down with a witness in person these days it might be on video but nevertheless you've got to listen to the person and work out how they speak if they are a sophisticated client they might use sophisticated vocabulary great, you can draft it in those terms. But if it's somebody who doesn't use sophisticated vocabulary and you start using long sentences and words that they would never use, um, they'll be confused and it will not take long for that all to become unraveled in the witness box. And as I said, it, you know, it, it is not uncommon for people to say very quickly, no, no, I didn't draft that. 
um, which undoes all of your hard work and is, is very unfortunate. Um, also use of language which is readily understood. And when you are in particular drafting the first affidavits, if you're the plaintiff and this is your claim in chief, the judge or the tribunal reading this evidence knows absolutely nothing about your case, nothing about your client, nothing about the deponent, nothing about the dispute, nothing, nothing, nothing. They come with zero knowledge. So simple, keep it straightforward, tell the story in chronological order and tell it in a way that assumes that the tribunal has no knowledge. It's quite easy to write things with your own knowledge if you've been working on a matter for a while without realising that you're assuming the reader already knows some things. They know absolutely nothing. Um, again, that's also part of Derek's um, uh, idea of only using one topic per paragraph. The shorter the paragraph, the better. Just stick to one subject. If the witness is moving on to something else, start a new paragraph. Now, um, for those of you who practice in technology and construction list, you'll be familiar with um, the practice note um, equity three, which um, governs the technology and practice list. And if you have a look um, when you've got lots of time later and you can't sleep at section 36, you'll see it talks about a chronological bundle of documents. And whilst it's not um, absolutely expressed, it seems to me the intention of section 36 of that practice note is to say, Produce one chronological bundle of documents at the beginning of preparing your evidence and everybody can refer to the one bundle of chronological documents. You can add to it as you find other stuff on the way, but just have one bundle and everyone can refer to the same things. Now, there's obvious joy in that, the one bundle. When you get to hearing then, you're not having to produce another court book and so on. And the other obvious joy in that is not having five witnesses putting on the same documents exhibited to their affidavit, which happens over and over and over again. Have there's also the realisation that comes from the, the, there's the facts come out of you from and the, the facts come out of you. Yeah, absolutely. Things that your lawyers miss become... Miss, uh, and, and, um, and it's quite a good tool for working out what evidence is missing from your opponents as well, for example. If you're clear from your list of documents and your evidence, what happened on what date in chronological order, you can see what's missing what your um, opponents haven't addressed because maybe they don't have an answer to these things that you've picked up. Um, if you don't do that, you end up with a situation which we often find ourselves in the week before trial where you've got multitude of affidavits with a multitude of exhibits that exhibit the same things over and over. So right now I've got a, a matter that's going to trial very soon and there are, the contract is in the affidavits four times, only four times, lucky me. Um, even my own witnesses exhibit the same documents to each affidavit and some of them exhibit the same documents twice in the same exhibit. Um, you know, it it's, it's, sounds insane when you look at it at the end, but those things just keep happening over and over. So if you can possibly take up the suggestion in the practice note of having one bundle and everybody refers to it in chronological order, it makes so much sense and you'll save so much time and effort. And is that, is that ma maintained by the plaintiff? Is that the usual... Um, I don't think the practice note even suggests that it's necessarily maintained mm. by the plaintiff, but um, you know maybe each party has their own. Again, you'll yeah. have duplication yeah. there, but less duplication. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, if there's any chance of agreeing a bundle with the other side, great. But I appreciate that uh, that's not always practicable, and sometimes people can't even agree what day of the week it is. So, um, there's a question for you. See how you go. Well, sorry, it's a practical matter. You mean for pay, pagination? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you get the, 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 the deponent of an affidavit that's referring to the contract dated blah, 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 page something or other, how, yeah. do, you, how do you do that? Do yeah. You? I agree that that is difficult and that is challenging and I think that is one thing that, that puts people off uh, that idea. I mean look you can either insert pages you know 1A, 2A, 3A or whatever as you go as you go along or um, quite often I, I'm finding, I don't know if other people are, that um, exhibits are done by um, using an electronic document which has some kind of you know, 13 digit reference number rather than a, a numbered page in any event and so if you're using electronic documents with those things, you don't have a page numbering problem because you're just linking everything to the 
thing. Um, so, I mean, I, I think there are a few ways around it. I think those things will change as well over the next wee while. As everybody moves to electronic bundles and documents, there's still, you know, the court's still sort of pretty 50-50 on where they are. Some, some court judges will only use electronic bundles and some will, will run a mile and are still looking for everything to be in paper. Um, but if you can work, work that out and work, work a system that you, allows you to drop other documents in later, um, you know, it really is it's such a bonus going forward that everyone's got the same bundle. And just for those for people who are online, the question was, how do you go about paginating? The how do you go about paginating? The question may not yeah, have been heard. When you're adding bundles later on. Um, so first draft of a witness statement or, or an affidavit, um, sit down with the witness if you possibly can. Um, try and avoid a phone interview. It's much better to eyeball the person and, you know, you'll get a measure of them as well. And bearing in mind... You know, you've got to sort of form a judgment about how, how these people one day are going to perform in, in the witness box. Be prepared. Again, we can't stress enough that going through things in chronological order um, is uh, is really the most obvious. And understand that it that it takes time. I mean, there really is just no getting away from the reality that these things uh, take time, particularly if you're dealing with somebody who has never given evidence before. Uh, you've got to explain the whole process to them as well as trying to get down their evidence and um, you know they'll want to review it and change it and so on. Um, give the draft to the witness so they can have a, a good check of it and you probably need to see them again depending on, on how extensive their evidence is or whether they've given evidence before um, and if they've read it properly they'll have questions, they'll have changes, they'll want to put things in their own words um, and you may need to test them, as I said before, if their evidence is clashing with other evidence or with documents and so on. Um, give them some time to sort of try and let the dust settle. People like to think about things and ruminate a bit and sometimes um, change. Um, Derek's talked about defined terms um, and using them sparingly. One of my absolute favourites also is that the defined term is longer than the thing that you are trying to define. <laughs> I know, I, you know. Um, or it's never repeated. It's never repeated, yeah. Or, 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 or always a winner. Um, and uh, there's some uh, uh, other um, no no's. Um, another no no is do not get your witness to um, paraphrase a document. If they're referring to an email that they sent on such and such a day, the email speaks for itself. They don't need to summarise what it says, or worse, paraphrase somebody else's email as to what they thought it meant or you know, what, what they now wish that it meant. Um, everybody can read the document for itself, okay? I sent an email and here's the date and here's the email. That's it, you don't need to say, paraphrase what's in it. Um, and uh, witnesses also don't need to um, say what they meant to say. If in your email you say, um, I'm never going to do business with you ever again, you don't get to later on say, what I meant was, would you like to come in for a cup of tea? It says what it says, and um, explaining in hindsight that you actually meant to write something else, that's not evidence, it's not, not admissible. The document says what it says. Um, try to avoid making submissions. So, for example, um, I've recently seen in some responsive evidence um, a witness saying, I've now read the um, evidence of Mr Smith on the other side. Mr Smith does not adduce any evidence of blah, blah, blah. Now, that's not evidence that is a submission on the admissibility of Mr Smith's evidence it is not evidence in response in any way shape or form and that is surprisingly common people um, commenting on other people's evidence that's not evidence um, a couple um, more of the uh, Sedley's laws for you just um, for uh, greater amusement uh, Derek got up to five. The sixth law is at least 10% of the documents shall appear more than once in the bundle. I've covered that with my um, examples of the um, exhibits. It is astounding how many duplicates you get in um, uh, evidence. Um, the seventh law, as many photocopies as practicable shall be illegible, truncated or cropped. We've all seen those ones, missing documents. The eighth law, significant passages shall be marked with a highlighter pen which goes black when photocopied. <laughs> Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, ninth law, at least 80% of the documents shall be irrelevant. This is back to telling the story, only getting the stuff that's actually in dispute. There's huge amounts of correspondence on things that are not relevant and try not to take the, I'll just put it in in case, 
approach because if you keep putting everything in in case you'll get thousands of pages that just don't do anything. Um, only one side of any double-sided documents shall be reproduced of course take your pick you can have the odd numbers or the even numbers whichever you put under no circumstances put both. Um, eleventh law transcripts of manuscript documents and translations of foreign documents shall, shall bear as little relation as reasonably be practicable to the original. Excellent. And the twelfth law is documents shall be held together in the absolute discretion of the solicitor assembling them by a steel pin sharp enough to injure the reader, a staple too short to penetrate the thickness of the bundle, tape binding so stitched that the bundle cannot be fully open, or a ring or arch binder so damaged that the arcs do not meet. Um, that's of course a classic, and so is the overfilling of the ring binder so that you know you could not possibly get the last page of the uh, binder open. Um, I, I think, um, although they're tongue in cheek, they really are obviously real examples that the bench has seen many a time. So, you know, remember it's a human process. Judges like to have things that are nice and beautiful and neat and easy to read. So, you know, endear yourself to the bench by giving them very, very beautiful things and you'll be getting off on the right foot. Um, I think that's most of the things that I uh, wanted to cover in the um, requirements of how. So, um, Maybe we'll ask you if you have any questions. I work in medical negligence. Um, my clients always want to talk about what they felt in terms of pain or um, specifically in terms of, unfortunately, the, the description of pain is actually very relevant to their mm. course of action. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult to sort of, how do you express that in terms of not an opinion, but in terms of how someone's actually objective feeling that they were having at the time in their body. It's very, I think it's probably something for me that I find very, very difficult. Um, and I guess I just want to know, because I'm in my first year of practice, mm -hmm. um, I guess I just want to know how I can better ask that question and better get that point across that that was what they were feeling at the time. Yeah, I mean, as you say, that's going to be a very relevant question in, in your line of work, whereas it you know, quite often in our area, nobody cares about anyone's feelings, really. Um, <laughs> uh, and it, it's, it's not terribly relevant. So um, you know, I, I guess one, I don't practice in that field, but one, um, I think thing would be very important is to get down their actual words, because it is their yes. words, isn't it? Yes. And it's going to be very important for a judge to understand from that person that level of pain or so on, if that's part of the measure of their damages. And the expression of the opinion is, is essential for understanding as to what they're conveying. It's, 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 they're not expressing an opinion as to, uh, on a medical basis, the, the cause of it was X. They're simply saying, you know, and th this was the level of pain I was suffering. Yeah, I just recently got objections back that I'd given opinion evidence in terms of um, uh, the, the patient was talking about a, a, a stitch coming undone. And so how did you know the stitch came undone? Well, I felt it come undone. Like, I felt my skin pull up. That no. was, and that was considered, um, I got an objection back on that basis. What so, was the ruling on it? Uh, not in favour of the defendant. I think you were right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> not in favour of the defendant. So I, I, I got through on that one. Yeah, but. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, again, the, the, you know, I'd imagine what, if, you, if you're dealing with that witness, well, when you say that, what do you mean? What happened? What did it feel like? What did you experience? Did you see something? That, are the, I guess the, the fundamental questions. I mean, I've got to say, medical negligence is not an area that I know much about, but they, they, they are, in fact, anything about. But the, the, the form of questioning, um, it certainly appears to be relevant. Um, um, but give the witness their, his or her, his words. You know, it's the worst pain I've ever experienced. Or what sort of pain have you experienced before? Yeah. Um, I hope that's useful. That actually was. Yes. So that I'm not sure if people online can hear your question, but that question was direct. Maybe we should repeat the questions when they're asked. That question was in in the context of medical negligence practice. How do you convey the extent to which a witness says they felt pain without offending the opinion rule? Did you have a question? I, I had a similar question about balancing the tension often between allowing witnesses to speak in their own language, and then on the other hand, ensuring the affidavit is in a permissible form. So for example, in a care and protection matter that I've had where the witness understandably was very emotional in their affidavit, mm -hmm. and then very, very senior counsel took a red pen for 
that very emotional expression mm. in that day. Um, so how do we balance between balance letting witnesses use their own words and language and like I said, then on the other hand, ensuring it's admissible and persuasive for a court or tribunal. So the question for people online is how do you balance on the one hand the 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 giving the witness voice uh, and the tension between that and ensuring the admissibility of the of the evidence. Um, was it, it, it inadmissible because it was an opinion? Is that is, well, was that I the mean, problem? Senior counsel just thought it was irrelevant and just inadmissible. I mean, technically, perhaps it was, but it was also the witness got very upset that they weren't allowed to express what their evidence was in their own words. Yes. And there was a bit of a falling out, um, and obviously the subject matter is quite different to perhaps bog standard commercial litigation. But um, yeah, just that tension. I mean, some of that's very difficult, isn't it? Because you've got to try to tell your witness why, whilst you have every sympathy for them, the court's not going to take that feeling of theirs into account when reaching whatever decision it's going to reach and try to perhaps explain why it's not relevant, if that's the problem with it, on that basis. Um, and But if, if that evidence is in, then in their affidavit, it's likely to be struck out. Um, you know, it, it's not, not easy when you're dealing with emotional clients. So um, I imagine that's, that's a bit of a challenge, but... Um, uh, but it's, it's, I mean, you'd say quite properly that it's, it, it, in some practice areas, um, you'll deal with that more than in, in, in others, but even in, in construction law, in, in commercial law, you will find client, clients, that they've got a version of events and they want, the number of times you say, I want that judge to understand, but the judge really doesn't have to understand because that's not the question that the court is being asked to determine. Um, what I have found is that sometimes just allowing a witness to get it into writing, getting it into a first draft, and then working back from that saying, well, look, this is really not going to assist. Um, and probably giving it for letting counsel or senior counsel make the call on it might might be your way of, of getting around it to say, well, they had to make that call. Um, um, but certainly the, the, the case law refers all the time to the, the role of solicitors, the role of counsel is to keep the evidence focused on what are the issues for determination, what is relevant. So there is going to be that tension. And it's unfortunate in that case that the there was a falling out between the sister or between the client rather and senior counsel. But the reality is that um, those calls have to be made. That is. Um, I have a question about um, summarising documents or paraphrasing mm -hmm. documents, and whether you see that there's a tension between trying to tell a story or having a persuasive affidavit in circumstances where it can become sort of a list of an exchange of documents mm. and whether, you know, someone reading what is essentially a date chronology is reading something that can be possibly persuasive or are you better off trying to, if not paraphrase the email, is, is there an acceptable level of kind of description of a document that makes the affidavit itself easier to read mm. rather than having to mm. sort of flip or draw attention to specific parts of documents? Yeah, so is there a bit of a tension in those two aims? Yeah, I agree that that is a bit challenging, you know, and you could end up with an affidavit that just says, I sent this email, I've got this email, I sent this email, I've got this, you know, it's boring, and boring as well as, as, well as anything else. Um, but really that's, you know, it's not really that witness's evidence because the documents will all go in anyway. And so really the witness is, you know, should really be confining themselves to what did they see? What did they hear? What did they do? That it isn't otherwise told that story in the documents. Um, look, I, I don't know if this is necessarily a wrong answer. Lots of people paraphrase and lots of people say, you know, I sent an email on this by which I did X or Y. And in a case I was in recently where everybody's witnesses did that because it was, you know, eons worth of correspondence over many years, um, the parties just agreed a sort of general objection, which, which was that um, all of it would stay in but subject to the sort of limitation that the court would view that the documents would all speak for themselves and the court wouldn't really take any notice of what the, the witnesses said about the documents, but then the story was still able to flow. So you know, I don't know if that's a halfway house that kind of mm. you know, gets people there. Um, 
I would, you know, say as little as possible, but still tell the story is probably the best you can do. It's not, it's not easy, the answer to that, I agree. Well, sometimes extracting what are the, the really just the relevant bits in a very long email chain yeah. can, be, can be useful. I mean, I've heard judges say, am I expected just to read a, the solicitor's file? And that's to your point about, well, otherwise you've just got a chronology of correspondence and the correspondence is elsewhere. And you've got no, from reading the affidavit, you've got no sense no of why it is that those documents mm -hmm. may or may not be uh, material. Um, again, it's this question of judgment and balance, isn't it? And I think, you know, there may be circumstances where pulling out a little bit of, of an email, but mm -hmm. doing the whole slabs of, you know, three pages of correspondence, obviously, is not going to, <laughs> not going to assist. Um, oh, yes, because, yes. Um, you may have already answered this in part just then, but what do you think about in the body of an affidavit extracting part of an email or a whole email if it's not too long, if it's an importance of the email or letter or something like that? Yeah, yeah and, and I think if you're going to do that, it's better to extract it than it is to paraphrase it, for yeah. sure. You know, and, and it may be that you know I got this email which included this, mm. and after I got that, because having read that, I then did the following. I mean, it, you know, you, it might be part of your story that's that's quite easy to tie in and show clearly why it is that you're relying on that bit. Yeah. I do think that's better than put, having the witness summarise it in a way that yeah. is inconsistent with the document. Yeah, but a faithful reproduction of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, faithful. And included the following extract, or included the following exchange, whatever. Um, okay, I'm not sure whether we've got any questions online. Um, I don't think so, and we're probably almost out of time as well. Yeah, it's okay. uh, um, so well, exciting that you know it goes it goes the whole hour. Well, we might uh, uh, leave it at that then, and thank you everybody for uh, attending tonight and those online as well, and for uh, your questioning. Thank you.